So as I mentioned earlier, we, um, uh, Gallery Lane Cove sits on Camarogal country and we pay our respects to all traditional custodians of the land. And we are very honored um, to have all of you with us today. We have with us um, uh, on our panel, uh, Nell, um, Paptawan and Christina. So all three of them are um, artists in presence of mind. So in terms of the format for today, we are going to show you, if you haven't seen their show, the virtual um, version of the gallery, uh, focusing specifically on each of their works. And after we've gone through um, the discussions um, from each of the artists and um, broadening the, 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 the scope of um, um, the chat, we will then move on to a Q&A session. So for the Q&A session, you're welcome to turn on your video and ask questions directly. Or if you prefer, you can just um, you know, type your question into the chat and we will, we will then address that accordingly. So let me just begin by um, showing you the virtual gallery. If you just give us a second. Right. So this is pretty much a digital replica of the show in the gallery. Sorry, can I ask um, participants to turn off their video, please? Thank you. And we'll start with Christina's work. So you can see here, this is Christina's work called In the Suchness. It is essentially a meditation corner, but there are very many layers to this work. So it's a screen-based experience. And before I play the video, if you have a phone, so with all participants, if you want to experience this right now, if you've got a phone, you can go over here to where the QR code is. We can scan on that and we can turn it around or you can sort of navigate this on your own screen if that's easier. But for the purposes of our discussion, I'm just gonna start with playing the video. I think the audio might have been disabled for some reason. Oh, there's no audio on this web. Oh yes, there isn't. So Christina, would you like to begin by telling everyone about this work in the context of um, the topic of discussion? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> thanks, um, thanks again uh, to Gallery Lane Co for putting on this public program and um, giving us the opportunity to discuss and share our work in this way. Um, so this is my work um, in a suchness, and I think when I talk about this work, I want I, I have to give you some uh, some background of how the work came together and in 2020 during um, the first Sydney lockdown um, because of the COVID restrictions my research um, my PhD research pivoted from um, thinking about how I could create kind of large public installations towards using first person methodology so that I could continue um, the exploration of, of my um, of um, the themes that I was looking into. And I conducted an autoethnography in the form of um, self-observation of doing a daily practice of Tonglen. And Tonglen is a Tibetan Buddhist um, 
uh, meditation. It's um, an embodied practice of compassion cultivation that's become quite popular in the West. And um, it's commonly translated as the practice of taking and receiving. So, um, oh, to tell you a little bit more about the, the practice, I think it's um, important, I guess. Um, it's you, in the practice, you imagine taking in the suffering of others and uh, in the form of dark smoke um, and actually bringing it into yourself and then allowing it to touch you. And then with the out breath, you um, visualize offering a balm to this suffering and um, in the form of light that comes from within you. So inner suchness materializes um, the findings from um, and from the documentation of this first person study into an interactive digital experience. Um, as Rachel already mentioned, the work is a single channel looping video um, and an augmented reality um, in the in the installation as well as meditation cushions, and it invites people to sit and interact um, with the video if they choose to. Mm -hmm. um, the the video is a performance with my collaborator on this project, Wendy Zhang. Um, Wendy is a motion designer and um, design researcher, and she uh, worked on the 3D animations and the coding for this project. And she's also a colleague of mine at the Design Lab at the University of Sydney. Um, so within the video, um, I've laid in, in illustrations, visualizing thematic processes that emerged um, from my study, and I used textual prompts to trigger um, the AR and the audience can interact with the artwork using their mobile phones. The, the work itself, it contains a lot of meaning and symbolism and suggestion. Um, and uh, one of the main ideas that I held in my mind while I was creating it um, as a metaphor um, is the concept of a mandala. And um, would you like to explain to everyone what a mandala is? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> um, so mandalas um, are representations of a universe and commonly in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, mandala offerings are a daily practice. Um, they're done before receiving teachings. Um, mandalas themselves are, are used as um, visual tools for awareness and meditation. Um, they're traditionally quite intricate and detailed. However, the, the concept of the mandala itself is an offering of the universe that's made to um, the lineage of, of, of wisdom and teachings in Buddhism. Um, so I, I guess, um, I think I'm talking too much, but I just wanna talk a little bit about in respect to the theme of the panel um, in terms of fear. Shall, yeah. I, shall I talk a little bit? Um, yeah, yeah, I think- about that. And, and how that applies, you know, with your work and whether it be the process or, you yeah. know, the outcome. Sure. Um, so in terms of fear, I think, I think the work speaks to portraying um, a sense of exploration um, of a landscape. And in this case, it's um, the mind itself. So the idea of um, confronting whatever shows up, um, whatever's there, you know, um, virtue, delusion, craving, joy, bodily sensations of pain and pleasure and um, meeting all of these um, and moving through them through the practice of um, through through a daily practice. And I guess um, that willingness to embark on this development of a relationship with yourself has that aspect of fearlessness, because often, you know, it's with the mind, we we're scared of kind of what lies within us and what we could find. So you know, it's that um, having a sense of um, of fearlessness to to meet whatever whatever um, whatever's there. And also another aspect of fearlessness is um, I think this is connected with the actual practice of Tonglen. So normally we might associate um, compassion with a sort of a gentle like softer quality, um, but then as you move, as you as, like familiarizing yourself with this practice, you begin to touch on these, on um, aspects of the practice that are related more to this sense of courageousness and, um, and bravery that comes with persistence and resilience and determination. Um, 
of revisiting, you know, and persisting with, with the practice. And, and these are like within that development of compassion um, and held in that a sort of tenderness. So um, can you talk about how that sort of intersects with the art practice? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, having, you know, not always knowing, you know, this sense of unknown of what the finished product will be, because I think particularly at least with my, with this work, um, I, I mean, I started off with processes that I wanted to represent and visualize. Um, so I didn't really know, um, what the final outcome would be. And it was a lot of, um, actually, the collaboration with Wendy um, really enabled me to have a dialogue with someone. So the practice, the artwork is really grounded in like a very a personal practice, but then um, then uh, discussing and dialoguing with Wendy was a, I was able to kind of um, yeah tease apart and. Um, think more about how to how to represent these processes like through form and movement um, I think yeah that sense of the unknown um, in art practice is um, carries with it this like anxiety or fear or um, you know and it's not it's being able to just sit in that discomfort I think at at, at times um, and letting go of like uh, any um, sense of expectation sometimes and um, preconception of, of what you had um, in terms of how you um, expressing a particular idea. Thank you. Now, there are actually two terms that we introduced in the topic of today's panel that probably needs a little bit of breaking down for those of you um, who are not Buddhists in, in attending at the moment and listening in. Um, so the, the two things that we mentioned, we're talking about confronting fear, samsara and non-duality in art. So samsara just very briefly is a Buddhist concept of existence where everything is cyclical really. It's about the cycle of, you know, birth, um, life, you know, whatever happens through life, you know, the happy parts and the unhappy parts and the suffering and then death and then rebirth and it goes on and on and on. So that's in a nutshell what samsara is. And um, non-duality is really the idea that, um, you know, the, it's a notion that absolute existence moves beyond any kind of concepts of good and bad, um, you know, positive and negative. It's sort of, it's, it's, it goes beyond you know that and some I just want to bring it back to your work in this instance Chris um do you think in in some ways that your work touches on on um, these two ideas as well or um I mean yeah when I think about samsara and nirvana as ideas um I I feel like it's a sense of moving towards like integrating, um, yeah, integrating the, the idea of coming together with like not having, or not having this separation between, between like this is my ordinary life and then this is my spiritual life. Um, in terms of the art, I guess like non-duality, I mean, there's, the the inclusion of the AR is like giving viewers the opportunity to access different dimensions of the artwork. So in a sense, the the the, the viewer completes the artwork. It you know it can't be complete without that that circuit. And then um, their participation is um, you know echoes that non 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 dual idea but then at the same time you know within the work itself like in the process of developing it with Wendy um you know we have these two like we have we're two people who are contributing to to the development of the artwork and I, I feel like that process itself is is also another another layer of that non-dual um mm -hmm. sense it's fascinating how conditioned we are um 
and this is the frame of thought that we think with, um, the framework that we think with rather, so often we, we perceive things through a dualistic lens rather than a lens of networks and interconnectedness, um, which this show, Presence of Mind, is very much about. Um, I will also just quickly comment and say that I have, um, as with you know, members of staff in, in the gallery, we have actually observed quite interestingly people who interacted with this work. Um, there are a number of them who have actually chosen to sit in the gallery space, which is fascinating, you know, to actually be in the space and actually be sitting. Um, not that we're observing everybody who comes through, but it is a quiet spot. Some people would look at the work and then you can see them start to close their eyes and sort of get into their own zone of meditation. So that's, that's a lovely sort of experiential and you know, interactive kind of um, process. So thank you, Chris, for breaking the details down. And I'm just gonna move to Nell's work. Thank you, Nell. So, if you look closely at this work, it says, nothing scares me. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. So we'll just freeze it here. So obviously this work, you know, deals directly with the idea of fear and fearlessness. So now would you like to walk us through, you know, what's the story behind this work? Yeah, and hi everyone. Um, is my sound good in terms yeah. of the level? Yeah, great. Um, I'm coming to you from Gadigal land. I'm at the Powerhouse Museum. And um, also thank you to Rachel and Lane Cove and Kath, the other curator for the show and the forums for people to talk further about their work. Um, so this work, the title is Nothing Scares Me and it's not really an idea because it's a face. You can see it pretty scale clearly and it looks like everything in the world has scared it in that moment with these bolts of electricity going into it. And so in terms of the theme of it being non-dual, like both are true, like it, what you say and what you're feeling might be different. All the bolts around the perimeter of the work are cut from ACDC shirts, so rock and roll t-shirts, and um, the lightning bolt between AC and DC is this thing in between which cuts through. And so I've used the lightning bolt a lot in my work as an ongoing motif. And also this face, which is um, both, yeah, both like known dual, both um, in ghosts, which is another work in the show and in all kinds of forms where the face can look like it's uh, screaming the pains of the world or it could be kind of sweetly singing ooh, <laughs> like in a kind of choir and it sort of hovers between the two and how you read it is how you are in that moment yeah so that's kind of that work it's pretty simple and by extension with those faces one of the reasons I'm using these very simple faces is because you can't unread a face mm -hmm. and so if I have a message or something I'm trying to say and I was making these works before emojis which is why we all love emojis because they say what you're feeling right more like you know if you're sending a word but you want to temper the word with a with a feeling you put an emoji in it so it's a, a strategy that I've actually used in my work yeah as a strategy so now, what, what were you thinking? There's actually a whole series of these works with different faces. So is, was there a particular moment that you were considering or thinking of something or you were just experimenting with some ideas that this came about? You mean for this painting series or those symbols that I've used in my work more oh, generally? Both. 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 Well, yeah, they evolved over long periods of time. So, yeah, yeah, I did just say it was a strategy, and that's how yeah. I'm using it, and that is that is true. So, there, um, but I guess it was more of an evolution. And um, Christina said something interesting before about, you know, how in some ways, how do you visualize these internal feelings, right? And that is the conundrum of art, like that you are trying to externalize or put into visual form 
concrete form, material form, something internal. It has to come from there. And so I guess having been an artist <laughs> all my life and going to art school, I was trying very different visual, uh, uh, all those visual things that are open to us. And this is something that um, obviously I did some time and kept working for me and kept, yeah, so I kept doing it. So there wasn't one moment, sorry, that was a long-winded answer. But, no, no, yeah. no, no, but that's, that's good to know. So I think we'll move on to the other work that is the hero image of this show. Some of you would have seen it. Sorry, it's, it's a little slow at the moment. Here we go. Yes. So could you could you talk a little bit more through it? And then I will probably um, respond as well and let you know we've got such a variety of um, different responses to the work from people visiting the gallery. Oh, is... tell me. Tell, let's share the responses. Um, <laughs> It, as, as you were saying, it's quite interesting because the way people read works probably references their frame of mind. So we actually had this little kid come up and say, that reminds me of Darth Vader, <laughs> which is completely, you know, not, not what's the intention. But over to you now, Nell, if you can. Yeah. Well, no, I love that it can hover between spiritual and pop culture. And what's the difference? You know, it's beautiful. That's cool. So this work is called I Sing Both Ways. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that's the whole premise of Samsara, Nirvana, black, white, sing both ways, non-dual. And so, you know, I made the, this work and had titled it before the show. And, yeah, the both ways is absolutely referring to that, that, that both are true Some you can hold things simultaneously in that non-dual way. Um, and so the work, for those of you who haven't seen it, is glass. It's a hand-blown glass ghost, which I made at Canberra Glassworks. Um, and it's all etched. So, um, and you have to etch it with a diamond tip. It took me five years to make over three different studios because you get no second chance with the etching. And water drips on um, where the diamond bit, drill bit, um, hits the glass and so you can't actually see what you're doing and you have to keep wiping it back um, and so and then there's uh, oil paint uh, rubbed back into it to make it white otherwise yeah it would, would just be quite clear so I had to be in the right frame of mind and right frame of body every time I made it and there was only a limit to how much I could do and also the surface changed and the turning so that's the making of it, the title of it, I Sing Both Ways. And then it's just peppered with whatever I was thinking as I started making that section of the work. This particular um, angle that Rachel's pulled up is actually a story um, the out, from the outline of Linked Flames, which is a story of um, women's participation in, <coughs> excuse me, um, Zen stories and this particular story is quite interesting it's about how, how a woman used her body and her sexuality to out, outsmart some monks. Could, could you just briefly um, you know talk to us about that that story? Well yeah. actually I haven't had a chance to reread it but <laughs> yes uh, that was the note the um she, she, she used her nudity and her body to outsmart it. It's, it's, it's as you can see, it's five paragraphs long. So, um, yeah, maybe you'll have to go and see the show or look more closely. <laughs> yeah, that's, a good, that's great for those of you who are based in Sydney. And if not, like I said, this, this um, virtual gallery function does allow you to zoom into a certain extent. Thank you. Um, now, is there anything else you wanted to add with this work? If, I'm going to try and pull up the other angle if you can. It's going to turn it around. Oops. I mean, oops. It is always such a privilege to talk about one's work, but it also breaks my heart because you know I just love that people can have their own, like seeing Darth, a kid thinking it's Darth Vader, and I always <laughs> feel like I over over articulate the work. But yeah, so there's obviously the non-dual things I was working with there are between a head and a body it's both a head and a body and both black 
and white and female and male in that story that I was indicating. And then there's, you know, happy and sad, and then there's tears and flames, so water and fire. So both the title and all the content in this work and most of my works is about that either collision between opposites, the paradox between opposites, the tension between opposites, or some kind of reconciliation between them, which is the samsara, nirvana, form, emptiness, dual, non-dual, relative, absolute, however you want to call it. So yeah, that's I think that's enough. Thanks very much, Nell. That 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 was a wonderful <laughs> um, yeah description and discussion about your work. So now we're going to move on to Pop Tuan's work here, over to the other side of the gallery. Walk everyone through there. Whoops, I just shot past it a little bit. Oops. Here we are, this wonderful installation. So thank you, Pop Tuan. Um, I'll let you explain to participants about um, this particular work and its significance with respect to the topic of the day. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pop Tuan, uh, talking to you from uh, Gadigo and Wango uh, country, uh, the inner, inner west of Sydney. Um, I too like to acknowledge the custodian of the land, uh, past, present, and um, emerging. Um, so talking about my work and the theme, um, I like to talk about the material, uh, material that I use and I worked on with. Um, it's a bamboo stick and uh, I write uh, text, uh, which I copied from um, the, um, um, the name of um, species and plants by the river um, in the Nepean River, um, the, uh, the uh, Yaramandi and um, um, the Hosbury River. Uh, from the book, um, um, People of the River by Grace Kaskin. Um, I, I have I can tell you a little bit of the background on that um, uh, research. Uh, it was um, one of the projects that I um, uh, collaborated with Sue Pedley, my fellow artist, uh, whom I shared a studio at the Ultimo Project in um, Mountville. Um, so we approached the, um, you know, the, um, we were making work for uh, the Lewis House uh, bequeathed uh, at uh, Penrith Regional Gallery. And uh, that uh, I dealt with, um, we, um, our, our um, proposition was uh, to um, approach the garden and the gardener and um, the, uh, to see that that is the starting point. And uh, in that um, premises, there was this bamboo bush. And I talked to um, Shane Robert to uh, mine the garden there um, about the, the, the bamboo. And um, so one thing popped up in my idea that uh, I asked, um, can you allow artwork to go outside? Uh, the external and uh, to that, um, uh, you know, Sue included, and uh, the curators said that um, they were kind of a little bit uh, taken aback of uh, the idea of artwork uh, in outdoor, in in the open, and subject to the weather. Uh, but my um, I was drawn to the bamboo because of uh, the story um, that my father related to my grandmother, whom I saw only once, and um, she was a silk weaver. And uh, something related to the the, the bamboo was uh, um, the, the the as a young teenager before menstruate, um, she sang. She and a group of girls sang. To 
the um, the the um, the 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 larvae the cocoon the um, what it's called to 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 sleep or and when you weave the silk and um, that you produce a delicate piece of silk so much that when you threw that up in the air, it made its way through the bamboo bush, run to the ground and scratch. And that stuck to me. And uh, when I saw that for the, for, I saw the bamboo at uh, this um, Lewis house, um, I, um, I relate to that and the story just popped into my, my mind. Um, now, um, having, and thank you very much, um, Rachel and Kat, to invite me to participate in this um, exhibition. Um, by that time, by the time you approached me, it was 2019, my mother just passed away, and I was um, really, um, I was grieving her, uh, her death. And I um, was handling with a project that I uh, committed. So, uh, so at one point, I stopped thinking that I could go on participating into this um, uh, this exhibition. But thank you for encouraging me to keep going. Um, that come to the idea when I approached the samsala because uh, on the ground there is this charcoal. And I, I make the space um, to accommodate the, um, the mark of uh, this um, never ending, um, you know, continuous um, line, which actually uh, turn up or in, um, in you know, uh, it, it's, it's, the, it's the image in the book that I kept for um, a while. It came from Chiang Mai. Uh, when I went to research my, um, when my mother started uh, en uh, entering this dementia stage, uh, I went to Chiang Mai. She talked to me um, uh, in Lana um, dialect, which, where she came from. And um, to that project, I started looking at the Lana culture, who, uh, which is uh, unfamiliar to me. Uh, and I um, acquire a book um, about the, the image, uh, about the, the, you know, the um, sort of um, motif um, that is sacred to, um, to the local and one in which appear in a, a protective uh, vest, kind of um, when you wear uh, people wear this garment to protect them from bad luck and from um, bad omen. So uh, that's uh, how I approached to, um, to this work. Um, and um, my, um, having said that, uh, I have to let you know that my grandfather, maternal grandfather was an herbalist and um, he also, um, chanting all this um, um, mantra in order to, to procure his uh, herbs or remedy for um, uh, take away the illness for people. So that's, that's about this piece. Thank you very much. Now I'm just going to um, broaden the discussion a little bit um, beyond the works in this practice and throw this very open question to our panelists. Um, now, the first question I've got is, um, to what extent do you think you are combining your um, you know, art practice and Buddhist practice um, so I've, we've heard actually this from Mel just now that it's quite, you know, um, integrated in that sense. Maybe um, 
Christina and Paptuan, you might want to follow on from that. Um, I, I am happy to go first, uh, if you don't mind. Um, the, how I integrate um, the practice and, um, and sorry, I lost, integrate it, that into work, the Buddhist philosophy. Is it, did I understand it clearly? Yes, yes. I think, I think that's, that's, that's sort of also is the, the, one of the key things we're looking at in this exhibition, which is quite fascinating. And we've spoken to all artists at length, um, Catherine and I, in the early stages of developing this show about how, if you recall all our in conversations with you, how your, your work and your practice is, you know, really, and you know, um, almost one, and I think that is quite fascinating to, to people because we have had people come to the show and expecting, oh, it's all going to be about Buddhist iconography. Oh, no, it's like any contemporary art show. So what is this show about? It's about that process and where it comes from. So, you know, we would like to hear from each of the artists and, and in terms of how that sort of integration works between your Buddhist practice and your art practice or Buddhist philosophy that you subscribe to in your art practice. Um, for me, um, it's something that you do with every day um, and you're not, no different from any other people sit next to me or um, you know, across the world, um, you do with things uh, daily. Um, the process of making artwork is one in which I dealt it daily. Uh, it's, um, I have to say, that my background was, um, my father was an artist. Uh, he's not only an, um, only do art practice, he's a choreographer, poet, uh, he writes, um, and he also teach, uh, not in um, institution or in an art academy, uh, academy. Uh, but uh, he uh, has his workshop and um, there are people who followed him um, he died when he was 52, I was 22. Um, but before that, I, I had good 10 years um, um, following him around. And that started from when I was eight. Um, he had a project in Buddhist temple and I was, um, I got that privilege to stay inside the monastery, the one in which that they not, do not allow um, any female um, person to um to live in that uh, not even a nun so um that um that take me out of the normal life or the normal life that i saw in other people's life even my family my younger sister is too young she was too young she was um about five and my older sister, she started into puberty, so she, you know, she had that female look. Um, I was angry, and then I, by that stage, I, um, you know, I can blend in as boys. And I, I went to the river, and you know, I, uh, but it doesn't take the conscience, conscience that. I was different. So um, watching my father dealing with artwork, um, it was like, um, this is his life. That was the only one life that he had. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, we just um, like, um, you know, going along with what uh, his practice was. One day he, um, I challenged him when I was 14, you know, when you're a teenage, I asked um, why you're a river, um, why, why you're drawing about river was like that. And he said that, go out and look at the water. And then I came back in, I said, I don't see anything like you're drawing in that river, in that water. And then he said, go again, now close your mind, close your eye. And that gave me the lesson. So now how my artwork, how I integrate into artwork, 
So every um, materiality of the artwork that I put in the process is a vessel, is something that I contemplate, a, a place that I contemplate um, about life. Having done that uh, one project, I left it and it carried that process of that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes I forgot what I dealt with because I, I moved away from that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, I would say that it's a vessel that carry the process that I dealt with that time. That's beautifully put, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, Christina, do you want to respond to that question about, you know, the integration of your Buddhist practice and, and art practice? Yeah, sure. Um, it's just so, uh, yeah, I loved listening to Patwan there describe um, that relationship she has with her art practice. It's, um, yeah, as, as art, as a vessel. Um, to contemplate life, so beautiful. Um, I think uh, for me, um, the exploration of, you know, as I learn more about um, and as I contemplate the, the various ideas and um, provocations that are presented from Buddhism, um, I think, yeah, I've come across more recently this idea and Nell put it as um, when we see paradoxes. And I think when you come across the paradox and you, you experience it as something real for you, you see that these two seemingly disconnected um, um, elements or aspects can are actually coexisting and part of the same process. Um, I feel like it's you, you think, oh, I've discovered a paradox. And then you think I must be onto something because <laughs> um it's not it just it seems like it's not connected like bees and flowers you know the two separate things but it's all part of this one this one thing and I think yeah art practice as a as a vehicle or a vessel as Patwan puts it um is is really the the connection the way of expressing um these paradoxes and provoking um people to to think about whether these paradoxes also occur in their own in their own lives in their everyday lives yeah is there anything you like to add now to that um, integration in your practice yeah um I guess I was just thinking that um as the conversation was happening that you know Pap Tuan had uh cultural Buddhism in her life and um, through her family and her culture, and obviously growing up in Maitland, I did not. Um, <clears throat> and what draws one to being an artist in the first place is the same thing that draw me to be interested in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this, there's this thing, Buddhism, and it influences an art practice. It's all about just being curious and open in the world and finding the things where you can be yourself and offer the most of yourself to the world and you know I as Pat Tuan also said there's no difference between her and anyone else in the world I always think the people who seem the most present don't know anything about Buddhism like a mother being present to a child or you don't or surfer on a wave you don't need to know anything mm -hmm. and so for me if it's not one practice in one life then it's not it it's it's not here. It's yeah. interesting because there's also um, equally other people who approach things in a very compartmentalized way. So I'm just going to move away from this topic a, a bit and talk about um, uh, briefly. And uh, again, this is an open question to all three of you. Um, were there any sort of either sort of art inspirations or sort of Buddhist or Dharma inspirations in terms of the development of the art practice. So it may be the case that it might be another artist who sort of, you know, integrates mindfulness or Buddhist philosophies or it could be something else. Is, would, would anyone like to respond? Um, Pap Tuan has gone off video. 
temporarily, if we could have you back on Pop One or or Christina or Nell, any any one of you. Uh, okay. I, well, I might start. <laughs> um, I, I feel I, personally being part of this show um, has has really inspired me um, as an as an emerging artist um, because of the depth and the experience of um, the other artists in the show. I feel like um, listening to them and taking part in the digital residency was really um, a way for me to see how different people are practicing and their understanding of integrating Dharma into their work um, in so many different ways. And yet there's this common thread. Um, yeah, even just listening to Nell and Patuan talk about their about the process behind their work is, I mean, there's a clear relation and it's very, it's very inspiring for me personally. Yeah. Thank you. Um, up to one, can we have you back? <laughs> is it a connection problem? Up to one, are you there? Oh, I think we might have lost it temporarily. Um, Nell, did, did you want to say anything from an established artist? Um, as yeah, well? so, um, well, obviously there's another artist in the show, Lindy Lee, who um, I introduced me to Buddhism and I worked with her as her studio assistant and, um, yes, she was always going off to Buddhist nights and Buddhist retreats and I thought that's all very interesting but I'm a bit too young. And, but I knew it was there in the toolbox for when I was older. So she is um, above and beyond the most uh, primary influence for that um, part of my life. But in terms of practitioners, yeah, like what I was saying before, is it could be the sound of a leaf falling. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a Dharma teacher or Thich Nhat Hanh who is equally amazing as a leaf falling. But um, the person who just came to mind at heart when you were speaking was Leonard Cohen because he um, has, he is in a Zen tradition and um, which is what I've more formally studied in a Buddhist tradition and his um, Dharma name because when you get um, take formal Buddhist vows in a Zen tradition you get given a name by a teacher and his Dharma name is Silent One. And um, when I did my vows, not knowing that that was his name, mine's one colour. So I just like that he's silent one and I'm one colour. That's How appropriate. <laughs> yeah. And I like how he talks about through his songs, very uh, dark and philosophical things, but then, you know, back on Boogie Street with the women and the ciggies, you know. So it's just like, yeah. So he's a bit of a Buddhist guru. That's, that's lovely to hear. Um, and Pop Tuan, thank you. Um, sorry, I think there was a bit of a connection problem there earlier. We were talking about um, your inspiration, um, whether it's a, you know, a, a Dharma, a Buddhist teacher or an artist that sort of influenced your art practice in general. Yeah, um, so um, the inspiration I got uh, all the time from artwork, from um, um, material from, um, you know, the later on, the, um, I, I, I spoke about uh, my immediate teacher and, um, you know, inspiration uh, from my father, but um, I can name a few of uh, people that uh, some of the work that uh, stay, um, um, recently I went to Khaled Sapsabi uh, work at Cambodia Art Center and he had a workshop at Art Gallery of New South Wales. We are a long time friend, not very close friend, but every time when uh, I m met him again, um, we make progress on the level of the continuation of the conversation. Um, no matter how, uh, how little we spoke to each other. And that was, um, I think we connect in, uh, in terms of um, uh, practitioner as art practitioner and also the approach in the non geology about spiritual, um, spiritual, spiritualism and uh, materialism, materiality, mm -hmm. and also the, um, uh, you know, the physical and the spiritual uh, things like that. Um, so 
Um, that is one example. I am also drawn by the work of John Marwal, the Bach painter, and uh, Emily Kingawari. Um, now, closer to uh, my cultural background was Muntien Bunma and uh, Aryala Jamransuk. Um, Muntien, the late Muntien Bunma, um, he dealt with um, his family, um, suffered from cancer, um, started from his wife, then his, his um, father in law, then mother in law suffered from cancer and then his own father, and then his own mother, and then himself. Um, by the time he and Araya had, um, um, uh, was presented, were presented together in the type of pavilion at Venice Benale, the theme was um, those dying, wishing to stay, and those living, preparing to leave. Um, he had a 13 year old boy. So now um, he's um, you know, a full grown up um, art, um, curator. But uh, by that time, um, we all felt for him. Now Araya, um, he's um, uh, the other artist who uh, co represented by, uh, at the Pavilion in Venice, also uh, dealt with death uh, of her mother and uh, of um, the relative. She, and then he, her own father, doctor, um, she dealt with cadaver, uh, reading the poem to um, this corpse uh, and presented a video. Um, she was uh, invited here to uh, work at, um, at uh, for a center of contemporary art so that um, inspired me about, um, we were talking about fearless. Uh, and then I think that is one of the artwork that, um, that said all about fearless. And, um, and um, another person is Mit Chai In who dealt only with painting the process. Um, he, uh, the one who founded um, uh, Chiang Mai social installation that took away from, took the art away from white wall during the 90s in Chiang Mai. And um, he took the whole uh, artist group to go into the cemetery um, and um, other places outside white, uh, white space. So that's all about the inspiration. Thanks so much. That's, um, that's a very sort of um, rich insight into your, your various sources of creative inspiration. Now, I'm mindful of the time and, you know, we could go on for quite a bit um, in terms of um, my questions to you and our discussion. But I think at this point, I like to invite people from the audience um, to ask questions. So if, oh, uh, let's just see why it's a uh, gallery view. Okay. Now, if you would like to ask questions, you can turn on your video and ask um, any one of us now, or, or you can just type your question in the, in the chat box. I'm sure there will be questions. Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, Jonathan Page here. The, the video is, has been stopped by the host. But I've got a question. Okay, let's just so you can turn that back on. Okay. Right. Are you are you back on? Yes. Oh, here we are. Okay. Oh, we've lost no, you again. Let's have a look. Oh yes, there we are. I know it's. I can't get it on. It's been stopped by host. It's not. It's not stopped. There oh, here we are. are. Okay. I've got, I've got a question for Christina. Christina, I, I found you, your presentation very powerful, and I've just got two um, interrelated questions. The first is that early in the imagery when, with the concentric circles, I got the feeling there was some, it reminded me of sort of indigenous work. And I thought there's, there's probably a lot of overlap between what you're doing and the indigenous view of the world. And related to that was um, the topic of fear and that um, 
in meditation with Tonglen and compassion, often one point of fear is when we lose the sense of self, when we cross over from having self to non-self and, and therefore unity with the world around us. Have you got any thoughts about any of that? Um, thank you, Jonathan, for the question. Um, I think, um, yes, the imagery in the work, I'll start with that, with that one. Um, I tried to leave it very open. It's, it's um, hugely inspired by um, Tibetan mandalas and the rainbow, the rainbow body, the concept of the rainbow body. Um, but just, it, it also, I mean, it's interesting that you also see a lot of um, parallels with indigenous art. And I think um, that abstraction of storytelling um, is, is definitely present in the work. And it's just, you know, allowing people to, to consider, you know, um, how they can abstract their own concepts of meditation and their own inner landscape um, and bring in their own stories, like through these simple shapes um, and solid colors. And, um, but then also like we, we worked with the idea of trying to visualize, um, you know, using time as well. So the movement, so leaving it open and um, while also just kind of giving it kind of a, like a, a, yeah, a form that people could, could use. Um, the second part of your question around Tonglen, um, actually one of the processes that, I, that, that, that emerged from the research was this idea of transforming and dissolving and, um, that permeability between, um, yourself and your environment. And, um, sorry, what was your question about that? Well, sometimes that induces fear because we, we let go our self and we merge into non-self. Into, we merge into the environment and we, let our, we have to let ourself go. And that can be very frightening. Yes. Um, I feel like I have that sense of that. that I, I know the, 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 the fear that you're talking about because you feel like if I'm dissolving, like where am I? Like what am mm. I now? Mm. And... Um, and yeah, I have, I have felt that. And it's, it's, I think it's really hard. Like I think about, I think about what actually was, what I actually managed to create for this exhibition. And also um, as I was creating the work, I, 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 I am thinking, oh, well, this is just the first sort of incarnation of, of um, how to really represent these processes because they're, they're, they're quite, there is a simplicity about them, but they're also um, multi-layered and complex. Um, and uh, and yeah, that that is an idea that you know that the the dissolvingness of the, <laughs> of the work, like there have there, there are parts in the performance that try to that try to articulate that, and also the way that the the shapes kind of move in and out of each other. Um, but I, I feel like. Yeah, there's there's also like the generative aspect that the work is that the work is also lacking that could be embedded into like an, a a future um, iteration of it. You know, like having that sense of um, the, the the gen the participation and generation of new forms in the work, not not simply just moving through um, this looping video. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, just want to respond to that as well quickly. Thank you for your uh, very good questions, Jonathan. Um, underpinning all of this really, and this is just personally for me, both as a Buddhist practitioner and a curatorial practitioner is compassion. So really the way around, you know, dissolving, you know, into the environment is everything that underpins it is compassion. If you think about others, and not so much for yourself, that fear actually goes away. So to put it kind of pretty broadly, um, when I'm curating for this show, I'm not thinking about me, myself as the curator. I'm thinking about the people I work with, the artists. I'm thinking about the audience. I'm thinking about an even broader community who is gonna be engaging with it. So that sort of carries things through. And that's, this is from a curator's point of view. 
one of the curators of this show anyway, but Kath, Kath may have a very similar experience to share, but this is another sort of perspective um, um, to sort of um, address your question in terms of um, what happens with that fear around dissolving of personal identity. I hope that helps. Oh, we've got another question here. Thank you. It's from Monica to any of the artists who feel like responding. Has mindfulness and or your spiritual practice always been inextricable from your art practice? Or have you practiced art and then became aware of its potential to express and communicate presence? To any of the artists? Um, who would like to address this? Can I ask one of you to <laughs> address this question? I feel like I just answered that exact question with what you said before. It's the same thing. And one, what started first? When, when? How can you say your first moment of being aware of anything? Can you even remember it? Like, so, yeah, I, I can't. It is inextricable because the only way I experience things is through whatever sacra cells I'm aware I've got at any time. So sorry to not have any kind of amazing answer. It's quite straightforward <laughs> to me. It's not straightforward. It's, it's beyond explaining in ideas and languages and you all know it, which is why you're all here. I think if I can um, take the heat off the other two artists, but you're more than welcome to <laughs> respond to when you're ready. I can say this from a curator's point of view, because like I said, Kath, my co-curator and I interviewed all the artists as we were developing this work. And I can safely say that there are a, a handful, the few, there are a few artists, a couple of artists who actually came into this through art. So they did not necessarily, and, and for those particular artists, they are quite clear that they did not begin as Buddhist practitioners. They came into that through art which is interesting. And yet there are others who sort of came from the other direction. You know, they begin as Buddhists, they begin their lives as Buddhists. It may be sort of so much part of their culture and then they practice art in tandem. So I hope that sort of addresses your question as well, but that's a different perspective. And it, Christina or Pak Tuan, would you have, would you like to add anything? I think I might just quickly add that I guess um, as the more I come to understand myself, um, the less I want to be this compartmentalized person and the more I want to be a, an integrated whole. So it's definitely, I mean, I loved Nell's answer. I thought it was brilliant. Um, <laughs> just because it's, it's completely, you don't want to have these two minds that are operating. You can only express through your, through yourself fully. So yeah, I feel like that's the way of being authentic is to is to have it as inextricable as the two completely interwoven. Yeah, I've just and got it, one. Well, sorry, Christina. Go. I was just no, no. I was just going to say and informing each other. Yeah, yeah. When Christina said that, I was like, well, every show is a Buddhist show, like you know, and that compartmentalizing of even a Buddhist show, I kind of feel uncomfortable in the beginning. I feel uncomfortable when I'm in a women, like show about women, like because, th and it's really important that we have these shows and so we can have communication and, and community around specific things. But then I'm a woman in all the shows I'm in. I'm a Buddhist in all the shows, uh, you know, it's, so it's like, it's, so it can only ever focus on one part of it and compartmentalize mentalizing things is the new dualistic mind if it goes and that's the, like say if you were only to be in buddhist shows well that could be really interesting for someone but not for for me and what you were saying rachel too that yeah people do have different relationships and i fully understand that but yeah i just don't experience it like that 
Thank you. Um, I think we need to wrap up soon, but we may have time if, if, if the panelists are fine for one more question. Do we have one more question from anyone? Well, I can ask another one if nobody else has one. <laughs> You're welcome to, Jonathan. Uh, uh, Christina, the, um, the, the, the scene behind you with the multiple hands um, is suggestive of Avalokiteshvara, like the, which is a manifestation of compassion. So that's like, a, like an ancient artistic image of compassion, ultimate compassion. I just wonder what you, what you think of, the, um, of that, of hands, like in the modern context of hands reaching out in that way. Like reaching out, we only have we only have two arms maximum. It, it seems as if you're 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 seeking to have far more than that. <laughs> yes, two are not enough. <laughs> two, hmm? two not enough. Two are not enough. No. That's it. Can have That's it. The yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the 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 image behind is just like an inverted um, image still from the video, and um, it it does speak to Avalokiteshvara, which is the, the Buddha of compassion that has a thousand arms um, as a ge in gesture of giving. Um, but then also in, in the video, um, in this particular section of the video, it's it's got Wendy in the middle with me sort of, you know, um, performing behind her with like all these overlaid arms. And it's it's also represents, you know, the, the seeking mind, you know, that the... Um, so yeah, it's working with the idea of like, you know, I, when I was performing behind her, I was had the idea of wanting connection and wanting, um, uh, you know, asking and also giving, but then it also came across as like distraction and um, these other kind of opposites. So it's kind of, yeah, again, playing to those two, those two sides, but, but being part of the same, um, the same body. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your questions. If we've no further questions, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time, um, our lovely panelists and participants. I wish you all well and have a good rest of the weekend. Thank you. <laughs>